Thank you all for coming to the first of two Stowe office panels. Um, the, the way at least we're looking at these office panels, uh, a lot of times in the past, uh, the offices have had individual industry days, which is our chance to let industry and other partners know what we're thinking, uh, what's coming down the path, what we've been doing, of course, but more importantly, what we're looking for in the future. Because of all the effort put into D60 and the great opportunity of having such a broad community here at the conference, uh, we're, I'm, my view is we're treating these office panels as our industry day this year uh, to let you know what's going on. So we've broken up the panels into two sessions. Uh, so looping back to yesterday and the discussion about mosaic warfare, uh, you know, we've got this notion of distributed system of systems kind of constructs that we want to be able to execute and adapt with blazing continuous speed. We've broken up the panels into two different aspects of this whole mosaic warfare concept. Uh, tomorrow morning, please come back to the second half of Stowe, we're going to be talking about the actual technologies that go into the mosaic concept. So all the things that we need to do to proverbially make the lightning bolts. Today what you're going to be hear about is we still have to have things that do something. Okay, you, you, you need the, uh, the, the little boxes hanging on the ends of those lightning bolts. Uh, I like to refer to them as the tools in the toolbox. Uh, and from a Stowe perspective, this really gets back to the historical meat of, of what the office has been known for, you know, the mission systems focus, the black box capability focus. Uh, so what you're going to be hearing from in just a moment is our panel of four program managers who represent different parts of, you know, call it the kill chain or the effects chain in terms of the actual actuators of that, the sensors, the comms, the decision aids, and, and things that we need to do to deliver effects. Um, but before I turn it over to them and introduce them, I want to iterate something that those of you who are old hats to DARPA know very, very well. For those of you who maybe are newer to DARPA, you need to know that the best way to get traction working with DARPA is not to just go out and look at BAAs, not to talk to office directors, but talk to the program managers. The program managers are where things really happen within DARPA. And to that end, before we get in, can all of our current program managers please stand up? All the current Stowe program managers. You guys can stand up too. Okay, so these are the people that when we're done here today, uh, all of you should be talking to and, and bringing your ideas in addition to the folks on stage. So, okay. With that as an uh, introduction, so we're talking tools in the toolbox to go into a mosaic warfare architecture. So uh, here on stage with me, we have uh, John Waterston. Uh, John is going to be talking to you about the sensing set of tools, okay, and our thoughts on sensing. Uh, John obviously comes from a background that includes a lot of sensing and signal processing work and is also one of what we call our pirates uh, here in Stowe with a very strong uh, maritime background. Uh, next we have Ted Woodward uh, who is part of our very strong uh, communications and, and, and networking group, although Ted uh, wears many hats that expand into a range of uh, signal processing and other types of uh, RF and even almost beyond RF kind of capabilities that you'll be hearing about. And Ted's going to be talking about uh, not how we adapt everything in the, in the broader mosaic concept that you'll hear about tomorrow, but you still have to have the physical links in there to be able to connect. So he's going to be talking about some aspects of communications. Uh, Dave Tremper uh, will be next up after him. Uh, Dave uh, will be talking about decision aids and how the, the actual decision tools that have to go in there to actuate all the tools in the toolkit. Uh, in addition to talking about uh, th those types of things today, Dave comes with a very strong uh, also RF and signal processing background with a lot of work uh, in the electronic warfare as well as uh, communications uh, domain. Uh, very broadly talented but also with a heavy Navy uh, background as well. And then we'll be rounding off the panel with John Gorman who uh, will be talking about effects and, and I won't steal John's thunder, effects from a Stowe perspective are a little bit challenging because you know if you were at a TTO panel you'd be hearing about hypersonic weapons and new types of bombs and really dramatic things that blow up and again we're the black box you know squeaks and beeps 
uh, types of people. But John will be talking to you about the notion of delivering effects from our stove vantage point. And John uh, also has a very strong RF and signal processing background, and we, we consider one of our, our uh, you know, uh, anchor people in terms of uh, radar uh, and other types of uh, radar-related signal processing. So with that as introduction, I'm going to turn it over to John and let him tell you about sensing. Thank you, Tim. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm kind of excited to get this started this afternoon. Um, as we bring in the first part of the kill chain and, and kind of set the context for the remainder of the mosaic story that you're going to hear today. This, as I see, is the foundation that we build upon for all of the awesome programs that we have in the office. Now, I'm representing not just my portfolio of programs, so you're not going to hear about maritime programs today. I'm really trying to take a holistic view of sensing and give you a perspective on, on different areas across the office that are, uh, have, have value and, and need your thought. I wanted to lay the groundwork here uh, that, that even this, this whole conference is based on, right? DARPA started in 1958 to one satellite. That's what's there on the kind of the far left-hand side of this graph. And with the proliferation of small sats in, in LEO and stuff like that, we're seeing out in 2025, you know, 9,000 types of satellites. That's the type of exponential growth that we in the Department of Defense need to take advantage of as we start thinking about the changes in the sensing community. Joe Evans has started a geospatial cloud analytics. I think that's starting next week or something like now. It just started. And uh, you know that's the type of program that's doing sensing based on a change in the infrastructure. But that curve isn't increasing fast enough in my mind. We gotta look at something like unmanned aerial systems, right? I just came from the aerial dragnet program. I gave that back to Jeff now that he's back from Duke. And we we see the growth here. We can't even see the exponential shape of this curve because it's increasing so much faster than than uh, you know what, what we had there with the 50, 60 years of spacecraft. UIS now is in hundreds of thousands. So we went from thousands to hundreds of thousands and are increasing exponentially there. Things like aerial dragnet are needed to find new ways to identify UAS in this urban environment. As we deal with clutter, as we deal with this increasing number of uh, sensing platforms that are moving. But again, these two areas aren't increasing fast enough. We gotta think about where, 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 where are we still seeing greater increases in the commercial space? And that, is what I'm saying is here in the Internet of Things. Well, the Internet has existed, so that's why I go a little further back in time. The, the rate of increase here is in billions of devices. So the estimations of 72, you know, 75 billion Internet connected devices are what we're looking to take advantage of in sensing programs like Ocean of Things, where there's a proliferation of sensors all across the ocean surface, and that changes how we look at data and sources of data. And so the overall trends that we're taking advantage in all three of these areas, whether that's space, air, or the network, is a decrease in cost and power. Right? That, that's just happening because of Moore's Law and the commercial investments there. But what we want to take advantage of is now this increased complexity, and because of that complexity, a capability that is completely new and available to our future sensing programs. I try to make this simple with, uh, you know, maybe looking at in that left column of where where do we how do we currently think about systems? And it's a story that we've heard over and over, whether it was in the Mosaic Warfare Brief, whether it was in TTO's Disruptioneering Brief, this this concept of monolithic exquisite systems. And that, that finds its way into our apertures, that finds its ways into our sensors, right? That we currently, we, we're trying to build something like a long baseline that captures the highest resolution where in a future system, resolution may be coming from a spatial temporal diversity, where you have small apertures that are only sensing millimeters away from them. But if you had thousands, millions of these types of sensors building that same picture, reconstructing that same type of resolution that was available only previously with a kind of a, an exquisite type of aperture. That same story can be made with 
the idea of platforms or how this quantity of platforms occurs, where we have a single high value platform that's at the center of an architecture to where we're distributing this architecture, making it mobile and allowing each one of these kind of sub users to participate and operate in that overall sensing framework or fabric. Mosaic would probably be the word that, that we would use in this office, right? So that's another way to be thinking about it. The, the other way is in diversity and getting to the combinatorical creations of where I'm sensing in RF, optical, chemical, pick, pick all these different modalities, acoustic, right? Where, where all of those mixed together start giving us a fuller picture than what we would normally go to say, hey, I know I have to only look in this one domain. I wanna find how something expresses itself in all the domains and fuse that back. Maybe not fuse it centrally, but coming up with local views of that picture. And that gets to where processing has moved away from the centralized computing to a cloud or even fog, an edge type of processing that is occurring now as you're starting to think towards internet-enabled devices. And if they still cost the same as the monolithic devices and we're increasing their number by an order of magnitude, we will fail, right? There's no way that we could fund a million, million dollar device things, right? That we're, we would need to reduce the cost by that same order of magnitude. And the commercial world has figured out ways to do this. We want to invest in these commercial approaches and take them into our sensing world. Notice there may be a trade-off in quality and quantity, and, and we need to find that and take advantage of that in our future programs. I created this graph to show, I think, a concept that that when you start increasing the number of things, so, so that blue line decreasing linearly is notionally the number of active devices in a system over time. And there's just either they're attriting, they're dying because of you know, their, their poor quality. It's all right, we're fine. Over time, the number of active nodes in the system is decreasing. And it's really probably not decreasing linearly, but for this graph, I made it pretty and did it linearly. <laughs> But the effectiveness of the system is nonlinear there, right? So you're getting, even with all of them there, your system is maybe 95% effective. And as you've decreased the number of overall sensors, the system is still performing in being able to derive valid mission output and, and taking advantage of this number, the system effectiveness versus number of systems nodes in the system is, is something you can take advantage of, right? This is imposing cost on the adversary as they're either trying to counter a specific individual system, they're not taking away the overall capability of your larger system. I, I alluded to it on the previous slide, but when you combine heterogeneous nodes, you're starting to get not into just N, you're starting to get NCN, right? It's the combinatorical, it's N factorial types of combinations. So greater than exponential types of combinations and taking advantage of those uh, numbers are where we see a lot of advantage in this space when you have more sensors, you have more sensors that aren't the same, and then figuring out how to put them together in their, in their new way. So again, it's this cost imposition comes about not, not because of the individual things are, are cheap, but it's because as they, if, if you get rid of a lot of cheap things, you still have a very effective system. So this, it's a resilient capability over time. So I wanted to focus my time on the, the remainder here on what's next. Where do I need your thoughts in the sensing world? Where can I point you to other PMs looking at these problems? Uh, Wide area search continues to be an area where we need to improve. How do you do that in a distributed sense? Instead of coming up with these monolithic systems and putting them across the battle space, could you do it in new and cost-effective ways? And that's cross-domain, cross-modality type of thing. Integrating those cross-modal signatures is very important because otherwise we just have a lot of uh, parallel layers and we're not generating that fused data. So integrating that's important. The question that people ask me all the time is with these low cost commercial sensors, won't you induce noise or clutter into your decision making and that the, the uh, follow on panelists will be talking about. 
And the answer is maybe, but I think with the increased number of sensors, you have a way to, to fight that increase in noise. And that's something that you're able to do now that you're able to increase the number of sensors up. Where the balance of processing sits, is that at the edge, is that at the cloud, and how do you have the right exchange of information between users to effectively use the communication links that we have. And um, automating many people teaming with, the, with the, uh, these autom autonomous systems, right? These are autonomous sensors now, and they're not just an aperture. They're not a dumb aperture piping everything back. They are autonomous pieces. And uh, we want to then generate information that goes across the network to the decision makers. And uh, I think my other panelists will talk more about that. I thank you for this. This is another mosaic. This is from the uh, Islamic tradition. So it's not only just the Roman mosaics that are out there, there's Islamic mosaics, and I think they're just as interesting. So I'll introduce you uh, Ted Woodward to talk about the connections of the comms that are needed in our, in our uh, I guess, kill chains. Or there you go. Thanks, John. So yes, in fact, my name's Ted Woodward, and for the last three and a half years, it's been my distinct privilege and honor to be a program manager in the STO office, and I'm pleased to see so many of you here today to hear us talk about uh, tools for the mosaic. So today, I want to talk to you about lightning bolts. Lightning bolts, not in the sense of a weather phenomena, but as a euphemism for the connections that flow between the composable systems that we want to capitalize on. And it's my thesis that uh, these lightning bolts are actually the most important thing that we need to worry about because uh, they're all over the place in our composable systems. For those of you that attended Tim's very interesting plenary talk, you'll no doubt recall this picture. Plenty of lightning bolts here flowing between the airborne elements that we have in our composable systems, but we don't have to restrict ourselves to the air domain. We can also think about ground domain, and this schematic of our ground communications architecture is replete with lightning bolts as well. But that's not the only place we'll find them. We can look on and under the sea at uh, uh, distributed effects change, and again, uh, plenty of lightning bolts in, in this situation. Uh, and in fact, uh, the point that I want to make here is that the grand challenge of the composable system is in fact the network, because if you defeat the network, you will defeat the system. So I want to tell you a little bit about what we're doing in STOW to address these problems and point toward some things that we may need to be doing in the future to talk about this. Uh, many of the attributes of the communication system that we need to address are related to fundamental network capability challenges. I like to think of them as three, the first being capacity, the second being availability, can I have the capacity when I want, and what security do I have when I utilize the network. So we'll talk about those challenges and what we're doing about them. In capacity, the challenge really is a combination of two things, both capacity itself as well as mobility. And delivering both of those together is a particularly challenging thing. Plenty of capacity with uh, fixed fiber systems, for example, but not so much capacity when we're contending with mobile systems. So the DARPA 100G program attempts to address this challenge by focusing on all of the dimensions of capacity and pushing the limits on them and recently delivered fiber-like capacity at 100 gigabit per second over RF systems that can promise the potential for mobility, delivering 100 gigabit per second performance over a 20 kilometer link in Los Angeles. This is a photograph of that link uh, running uh, from a, a, a position in uh, in Redondo Beach to a position in uh, Westwood, and you can see the two apertures there that are used to demonstrate the 100 gigabit performance and one of the millimeter wave dishes used to deliver it. We'll be taking that into the air in the next fiscal year and planning some airborne testing of this to deliver uh, highly mobile, uh, high rate communications. The availability challenge is the next one I want to speak about a little bit. In availability, uh, the Network Up program recently started here at DARPA is taking advantage of an insight, which is that the data plane and the control plane of our networks need not be common. We can separate them. The current state of practice uh, control, has both the control of the network and the data flowing in the network over a common infrastructure typically, but we can separate them and take advantage of the opportunity to create robust, resilient control planes to hold the network together, even if the high capacity data plane may not be present at all times. 
So that's an interesting challenge uh, to address in that program. The next challenge I want to talk about is security, and there's two dimensions to security I want to address. The first of these is content security. So how can I securely exchange information with my coalition partners? And the DARPA SHARE program uh, attempts to address this problem uh, by focusing on the, the, our, uh, revising our current rather rigid and inflexible security structures to a much more flexible localized one. And this, illustra this is illustrated in this graph here. Uh, our typical security structures realize, are realized over virtual private networks, which need to be authenticated and set up, typically over large, uh, over in large data centers remote from where you're operating. And while this might be fine in a fixed enterprise network, it's not so fine in a remote uh, mobile network. So imagine that you want to communicate from the tail end of a convoy uh, operated with uh, US forces to the head end of a convoy operated with allied forces, and you have to do that over a VPN that goes back to CONUS. So the DARPA SHARE program is going to address that problem by localizing these security domains. So a very interesting problem. The next problem with security is exploitation. I'm not, I want very much not to be exploited on my communications when I utilize the networks that are, flowing, that are causing information to flow between my composable systems. And the, uh, uh, there are three particular forms of communication that we're interested in if we want to protect our small units that are out forward operating uh, in, in uh, contested environments. And the first of these is team conversation. I don't want to be exploited when I communicate with other elements of my team. The second of these communications that I want to protect is a communications to a weapons platform or an aircraft. So this is what empowers small units with tremendous effect by being able to call upon all of the different assets that we see here on this graph. But I don't want to be exploited when I'm doing that. And then the third conversation is communications to headquarters. So I need to reach back to my headquarters so that I can instruct them to send me more aircraft or stop sending me aircraft, I have too many. And we presume the headquarters is a richly appointed, safely uh, ensconced uh, 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 facility such as this illustration from Dr. Strangelove. <laughs> uh, so the DARPA Protected Forward Communications Program is attempting to address this challenge. Uh, by imposing complexity at every step of the adversary's decision-making process, which he needs to execute in order to prosecute targets at the small unit. A and we're going to do this by protecting all three of the key small unit conversations from exploitation and denial uh, in a contested environment. So uh, uh, an interesting program that we're just getting started on. But I want to switch gears a little bit now and talk a little bit about what's going to happen in the future. So if we think about the road ahead, there are, I think, a couple of different challenges I want to engage you in thinking about. Uh, we want to wake up our networks. What do we want to wake them up to? We want to wake them up to the fact that we're in a new reality, in a new networked world. And these statistics from the ITU simply illustrate how things have changed since the year 2000 to the year 2015, both in terms of broadband adoption. You can see a tremendous increase in broadband adoption over that period as well as in the proliferation of mobile cellular subscriptions, which have gone from uh, uh, 10 in uh, the year 2000 to over 7 billion today, 97 out of 100 of, uh, per 100 inhabitants on the planet. So uh, what's important to realize about this is that when we look at a communications architecture of this type that we have developed entirely in isolation on our own, there's something wrong with this picture. And what's wrong with this picture is the context within, it within what it resides. What I'm looking at now is a picture of the cellular coverage map in a certain section of the world from the Open Signal website. And if you drop our communications architecture into that to scale, you find that it just vanishes within the sea of networks that we engage with poorly or not at all. So we need to change this situation, and the imperative is to engage with these networks. I've shown you already that these networks are ubiquitous, uh, but they're also very persistent. If you were to look, at, look in certain sections of the world in a contested environment, you'll find that these networks are still there and still operating. You'll also find that they are very valuable. And I use as an illustration of this point the net R&D investments in 2017 from three of the, of the world's larger cellular infrastructure providers. And if you add those all up, that's $35 billion being spent exclusively on this type of a network infrastructure, which dwarfs the entire investment of DARPA that we're here talking about today. 
So it's an imperative that we engage with these networks. And the question is, how will we do this? And I want to invite your thoughts and, feel, and, thoughts, and thoughts about that. We need to go beyond in another area as well, and that is mission awareness. We need to take advantage of the fact that our networks are not there to deliver bits, but there are to, they are there to deliver mission effectiveness. So if we can capitalize on mission awareness in the network, we can deliver information and not bits. Predictive insight can allow us to provide the right data at the right time for the right place with over the right network. And again, the question is, how will we do this? And we need engagement from you to help us with that, to help us to accomplish that. Because the network we need to deliver missions in this environment is certainly very different from the network we need to deliver missions in this environment, or the network we need to deliver missions in this environment, or the network we need to deliver missions in this environment. At the end of the day, what we actually want is composable networks for composable systems. So the challenge is to create networks on demand that are capable, both in terms of capacity, availability, and security, as well as network aware. What are the networks I have available to me, and how should I compose them for my mission? And we invite your help in trying to do that. So I now want to introduce um, Dave Trimper, who will speak to you about the next element of the effects chain. Thanks, Dave. Okay, thanks, Tim. to uh, be using your apps with any questions that you have as we go along. So welcome, I'm Dave Tremper. Right? So as Tim pointed out, my background is electronic warfare and, and I, that context of electronic warfare becomes important as I start talking about decision aids and what I mean by decision aids. Specifically what I'm getting at is how do you manage fast time decisions and, and because my background is electronic warfare, it adds some context to fast. Right? So fast is pretty ambiguous, it's, it's, uh, it, it depends on what the application is, but what I'm really getting at is how do you get into this OODA loop of spectrum operations to enable decision making in that space? Where, where decisions are happening so fast that the operator can't really comprehend the decision that needs to be made and so you end up with this mix of autonomy and a machine that's making decisions but it's providing decision aid to the operator so he can in, impart uh, commander's intent into that operation. So you look at this, great, this, this picture and you say, my God, there's the answer, it's right there, it's AI, right? AI solves anything, everything, why bother going on, right? And, and, and that's not the answer, right? While AI factors into this, what's more important for this fast time decision aid is the interface between that operator and those intelligent agents that are, that are residing behind that interface. Because while that machine can make decisions on information that it's seeing and quickly processing, it still needs to be able to incorporate commander's intent. It still needs to be op able to open the loop so that that operator can impart strategy onto, onto the game instead of, instead of just doing a, a fast decision. So let's revisit decision aids just in general. What does that mean? Right, so we have, we have information that comes out of our assessments. That's things that we predict, things that, that it looks like is going on in the environment and, and we think is going to happen. We have intelligence, things that we know, right? So this is data that we've collected over time that we know about our environment. We have things that we're hearing over networks, so other sensors are telling us things. And we have our own sensors that are seeing things. And so we, we're grinding this all together and we're making sausage out of it and we're putting that sausage in front of an operator. So the operator has an, can make an informed decision based on a lot of information processing that's happening behind a team. As soon as I add that context of fast time, of spectrum operations, that changes this discussion. Right? You, you can sit there and you can think through this process, oh, I've got this information. I'll think about this information, I'll make an informed decision. That description that I just gave you, right, millions of operations have happened in the spectrum just in that amount of time. So the, the, the environment has rapidly changed just while I was sitting there considering it. Everybody has phones in this room, and so there's, there's millions and millions of bits of information coming into this room and out of this room as we're sitting here talking, whether you want to or not, right, in a cooperative network. But what if you start applying that, that theory to DOD? What, what if it's actually not a cooperative network? What if you want to control that information flow? RF energy travels at the speed of light. The speed of light travels at 2.99 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, right? That number doesn't really mean anything until you convert it to something that you understand. That's about 180,000 miles per second. 180,000 miles per second is the speed of light. So that's how fast this information is moving around. That, that's essentially simultaneous. So how do you get into that OODA loop? Right, so how do you get into that space and actually make informed decisions that allow you to have continued strategic intent? And that's the important thing here, is that those interactions between sensors and emitters and that interaction in the spectrum actually has implications on your strategy. So while your strategy could have been planned months in advance, 
these little unintended interactions, if you can't account for them, if you can't manage them, suddenly you have a problem and it has, it has corrupted your entire strategy. So you have to start thinking on those scales about how you bring in that type of processing, how you, how you bring in that type of autonomy so that it can form an operator so that, that at the operational level, that operator can, can support that, that higher strategy without having a negative impact on it. And so I mentioned strategic and operational, in between is tactical. And so these are traditionally the three, le three of the levels of decision aids where you see them. You'll see them at a mock, right? So a maritime operating center, you'll see them at the tactical level in a carrier strike group, you'll see them at an operational level down at a system on a ship. And so that becomes important too because when you look at the sources of information, say on a ship, it's not a clearinghouse of all the sensor information coming into one place so that you can sit and chew on it for a minute and then make a decision. It's actually stovepiped. You know, you heard yesterday there in, there in the mosaic discussion, cylinders of excellence where you have an operator at each screen and they have their own decision aids. But really what you need is that ability to take the information across all those sources and form a decision uh, across all those spaces. And when you think about that in the context of mosaic, it becomes very challenging because you don't own the sensors, right? You don't own those sources of information. You don't own the end effectors. You don't own the actuators. You own the ability to take the data in and process it and analyze it. So you have to deal with all the warts that come with those sensors, the misalignments, the, the synchronization that doesn't exist between those systems and account for that uh, in your, your decision aids. And so when you, when you generalize that decision process, you have sources of information, you collect that information, you fuse the information, you analyze the information, and then you provide that currently to an operator who decides some course of action. There's timelines associated with all these things. And historically, that, that sources to information collection to fusion to analysis, that has also, that has typically happened on a digital scale within machines. And so where the, where the long pole hits in this time scale is actually when it gets put in front of the operator. So the, the moment the operator sees the information and then has to think about it and has to start deciding what he wants to do, that's where the real clock is set. So how do you enable that whole left side to inform these quick time decisions while still allowing that strategic intent to happen? And so when you look up on my, my profile, you'll see that my, many of my programs have that all source uh, uh, intro, so all source position and navigation, all source combat operations and targeting. That idea of all sources, how do you bring in as much information as possible? Make sense of that information, inform, inform an operation and then make that operation, whether it's put in front of an operator to make a tactical or operational decision, or it's actually given to a system so that that system can make an automated response based on this informed, uh, uh, this informed information chain. So when you start adding the spectrum conversation in there and you think about all these interactions, I, you know, I mentioned the cell phone interactions. Well, that's very similar to DOD, right? You have sensors, you have radars, you have communications. That information is moving uh, millions of bits per second, whether they want to or not. So how do you get into that OODA loop? How do you control it? So now your, your timeline is no longer just these, these kind of intelligence collection level timelines, they're more nanoseconds to microseconds type of timeline. I have a piece of information that comes in. That could, that could provide me a sense of whether I'm vulnerable or I need to, and I need to engage or whether it's, it's just an ambiguous environment that I shouldn't be worried about. On the right is a picture of a, a RCIED exploding. Right? So RCIED is a good example because you have a convoy driving down the road. They happen to wander into an area that, that an ID is there. As soon as the button is pushed and on that RCIED, that's essentially a weapon moving at the speed of light, right? So if you, if you try to make a decision when you've detected that weapon moving at the speed of light, you're probably too late to respond, right? So that means that you actually have to get ahead of the detections to start having decision aids that form, inform the operator on what is going on, what appears to be going on in the environment, not just what do I sense, but what do the patterns around me and what do the patterns of my sensor information tell me about what appears to be the environment that I'm wandering into here? And so then you start, you start to look at these intelligent agents and then how do these intelligent agents start to migrate into DOD operations? And you hear it all the time, AI for DOD, China's ahead of AI. How do we start bringing AI into the world? Well, you definitely don't want to do it the way that we saw in war games, right? If you've seen the movie War Games, where they walk in, they take the, the guy's seat away, and they essentially put a, a control on the, on the nuclear weapon launching system, and then the whopper goes crazy, right? You don't want that, right? So, so you start to think about what are the subtle insertion points for DOD operations and things like AI at the system and system of systems level, and it's really through these decision aids. It's really through these opportunities where you can quickly chew on information and provide informed uh, information to an operator so that they can make an informed decision. There's challenges with that, right? You, you don't just put that in front of an operator and say, look, 
you're good to go. This thing's gonna tell you what you need to do and you're fine, right? You can't do that, right? And so it, it brings in this training problem and everybody who's ever tried to apply machine learning or uh, any type of these AI things to practical problems runs into this data problem right in the beginning, right? You say, hey, I'm gonna do it. AI solves all my problem. Apply AI to this problem and someone says, all right, let's do it. Now give me the data so that I can train my system. Well, that data doesn't exist typically and it, and it specifically becomes problematic when you're talking about all these sensor sources feeding an intelligent agent, right? You might be able to get one of those sensor sources to give you data, but now you have to get data for all of those sensor sources looking over the same environment so you can train an intelligent agent to make an informed decision on that environment. So it becomes very difficult just to wander in to this space uh, with intelligent agents and start applying them. So then you have to start thinking about, well, how do you do that? One particular way you could do that is you, is you go to the, the way that the operators are trained. You go to the warfare schools and, and where they actually sit and they learn how to use their systems. Historically, they have a, they'll sit in front of the particular system they need to learn on. They'll learn how to push the buttons. They'll learn how the environment responds to that. And they'll learn essentially how to become an operator. What it looks like in the future though, you, you could potentially end up with a digital seat that sits next to the operator. And the digital seat is where these intelligent agents actually reside. And the intelligent agents are not only observing what the, what the scenario looks like, they're observing how the operator interacts with that scenario. And not only that, the operator can observe how the intelligent agent is interacting with that scenario. And that, that process starts to build trust. And if you've ever done uh, machine learning and, and artificial intelligence, you know that trust with an operator is an important thing too because you can't just wander in and put this thing in front of an operator and expect them to do great things with it. You have to establish a relationship between the operator and the machine so that the operator trusts what the machine is doing and understands what the machine is doing. And that also starts to bring in this idea of explainable AI. And so when we think about what's next and we look across this generic, this generic chain of decision making, adaptive architectures, I've got data coming in from all different places. I need to understand how to take that data, align it, synchronize it so that I can actually go through correlation and fusion. I need to do it efficiently. So there are, there are EW systems out here that we've spent a lot of time trying to make more efficient. And whenever you say more efficient and RF, you think power amplifiers, I gotta make my power amplifiers more efficient. What we've discovered on a lot of these systems is the efficiency is no longer in the power amplifier, it's actually in the processing, right? Because when you load up FPGAs into these systems, there's a lot of heat coming off of those things and you get, process, you get efficiency gains predominantly from, a, from addressing some of the processing challenge. So if high efficiency processing, fast time, sense making, predictive analytics, how do these pieces all to come together? Hybrid decision making, not just an operator making a decision, but the machine having to make these fast time decisions in support of a strategic operation while still informing that operator and allowing updates. And then I mentioned trust building, hybrid training, that schoolhouse, digital uh, operators sitting next to the other, and, and what do those future operating uh, interfaces look like that allow that operator to interact with these types of machines. And so I think a lot of what we're doing in the spectrum is heading in these types of directions, and some of these are, these are the, the bits and pieces that we really need to start focusing on for that. So with that, I will introduce John Gorman, who's gonna talk about effects. Thank you, so you heard yesterday uh, Tim talk about distributed lethality and uh, effects along with sensing, communicating, and decision aids, we form a distributed kill chain. And uh, one of the things that we'd like to do, I believe in order to be successful, we have to be able to create surprise. We have to be able to operate in a number of different situations. Uh, what I'll convince you of today is that we need to be able to operate over uh, cross domains from space to air to surface to subsurface. And we need to be able to operate in all different kinds of conflicts and uh, not just in uh, conventional kinetic and non-kinetic ways. We have to be able to uh, disrupt uh, our adversaries' uh, positions and we also need to be able to reinforce ours. So uh, what do I mean when I talk about uh, conflict levels and, and operating at all different types of conflicts? If you plot the uh, intensity of conflicts that we've been engaged in since World War II, as a function of uh, the probability of occurrence, what you find is that uh, a full all-out conflict is, is pretty low probability. Most of the time, we're involved in, in minor uh, conflicts or, or medium conflicts, and yet it's uh, our nature to design uh, high-end solutions to go against the high-end threat. And re in reality, uh, these systems uh, may be effective against uh, low-intensity conflict, uh, and they may be useful for preventing uh, a medium scale conflict from escalating, but they're by no means the only way. Uh, there are several 
other opportunities we have, and that's what we're looking to you guys to provide, is, is work with us to develop new ways of thinking and develop things that can be scaled across the spectrum. Uh, one of the ways that we believe that we can be more survivable and, and more cost effective and cost imposing on the adversary is by building up uh, a whole range of different solutions that we can employ uh, without being able, without providing the uh, adversary the opportunity to kind of predict our behavior. Because if we have these building blocks and can compose these chains at light speed, uh, then we will become completely unpredictable and we will be able to achieve uh, the whole notion of distributed lethality. So what are the types of effects that we might want to look and, and consider? Uh, we talked about you know, con traditional kinetic and non-kinetic approaches, but there's really a spectrum of different effects that one might consider. Obviously, we need to be able to have a resilient capability uh, that scales all the way up to a full force-on-force uh, -force conflict. Uh, but as, it, as with um, kind of the second wave where uh, GPS allowed us to shrink the size of the warheads and achieve a more lethal effect with a, mos with a smaller radius uh, type weapon, I believe that a similar kind of approach can be applied for the kinds of effects that we're talking about today. Uh, at the same time, uh, the adversary has been clever at denying us the capability of using our precision guided munitions, so we need a, a different way of, of getting to precision, de precision type effect uh, with the same kind of lethality that we have, but at perhaps a, a much more surprising uh, um, price point and, and, uh, and employability. Uh, we'd also like to do what, uh, we'd like to undo uh, what, uh, uh, for the adversary, what uh, Ted is an, and, and, and John are enabling for us. We'd like to prevent them from seeing us. We'd like to prevent them from communicating. We'd like to prevent them from executing and completing their kill chain. So are there things that we can do, effects that we can bring to break their uh, ability to close a kill chain on us? And then are there things that we can do short of a full force-on-force -force, uh, type of uh, an engagement to re reduce or or basically prevent uh, an escalation uh, from occurring. One of the things we're doing in the, pro in the uh, Stowe program office uh, that is a demonstration of this kind of scalable effect is the sector program or seeker cost transformation. And as an example of what we're doing, we've developed an open uh, standard for seekers uh, that goes into an open standard for, for weapons. And what that allows us to do is uh, we've, we've included in the system the ability to do uh, vision-based GPS-denied navigation. Uh, we've published that standard that allows us to go to any number of vendors that have that capability and integrate the uh, weapon and upgrade it on a much faster cycle. At the same time, we've also developed an open standard for uh, the comms and the sensor interfaces. So much like your iPhone uh, and your Android systems can get updated on a uh, every year or every six month basis, we believe that these same kinds of approaches will allow us to get much faster cycles on developing our systems. Effects that are being developed uh, in the office today could, could maybe transition and, and have an, an impact on a much shorter time scale than a, than a normal large uh, full uh, um, uh, procurement process. The, the other thing that we need to do is we need for these types of systems to be cross-domain compatible, whether it be an air-sea uh, situation where the horizon might be several hundred miles or an air-land or an urban operation where the horizon might be just over the hill or through that door. We need our solutions to be able to scale from, from uh, long standoff to short-range engagements, and we need these things to be compatible across the board. Uh, one example, for instance, is uh, the person who sees the target might not have the best shot. So uh, as, as Dave mentioned, we have this whole issue of how do we control the information? How do we ensure that whoever saw the target um, and, and designated it um, is able to deliver the right effect and that we understand uh, how to uh, determine the impact of that effect once it's happened? In this case, uh, we're, con we're concerned about the appearance of the object and the time we've, se we've seen it and, and whether or not there's any confusing factors. How do we manage that? So the thing that I'm interested in and, and in conjunction with my colleagues here is how do we put all this together? Is there some sort of a distributed uh, control and distributed identification framework that we can put everything into that would allow us to 
optimize and develop new ways of employing maybe old ideas uh, in a new surprising way. Uh, I'm reminded of the, the, the uh, conversation the other morning where the guy was talking about uh, uh, parents telling their grandkids how to use a tennis racket. Well, maybe there's a new way to use the tennis racket here in this case that we just haven't found out. Uh, we'd also like to understand in the case of uh, emerging threats that we don't have a lot of data on, are there some techniques in transfer learning and adversarial networks or other things that we might use to basically help us learn how to combat and fight in uh, denied environments uh, against new targets. And then certainly we'd like to have the ability to scale these effects, uh, not only to go against uh, peer adversaries, but also to uh, de-escalate and, and uh, control, uh, own the battle space. So with that, I'll turn back over to uh, our office director, Tim, for your questions. Okay, great. Uh, th thank you to all of you. So we have lots of questions that have rolled in and only, unfortunately, a little bit of time left, but we'll see if we can get through a few of these. Uh, so the first one, uh, I, I think was in the context of some of uh, Dave's discussions, but I think could almost apply to uh, all of them. And it's about training, and, and specifically training data. So, you know, all of you have mentioned various levels of AI type things, which are known to have lots of challenges, both with the quantity as well as the, uh, uh, e even the availability of certain types of relevant training data. C could you comment on do you think you have enough data, and can you train these types of things fast enough to be relevant? So I could, I could start, because we've looked at this problem from the, from the, from the sensor fusion and the spectrum operations perspective, and, and the answer there is no, we don't have enough data. And, and it's, it's not just a matter of saying, hey, we need to go out and we need to have all these sensors collect data. Um, one of the challenges is that if you collect spectrum data, and if and anybody who's worked in the radio frequency world knows that when you collect spectrum data and you collect what we call I and Q level data, that's, that takes up a lot of space, right? So, so when you're talking about time and you're talking about lots of scenarios and lots of data that, that's associated with lots of things going on in the spectrum, that's a massive, massive amount of data. And now you're gonna compound that by saying, I need a massive amount of that massive amount of data to, to train these systems, and, and so it becomes complicated. And we've had conversations with the DOD where we say, hey, we really need to get this type of training data from these particular sensors so that I can train these types of agents. Um, but, but it becomes more complicated when you want to train them holistically. You, you want to generalize their training so that they have a wide variety of experience. That becomes very hard. Um, well, I think one of the examples from industry that might be useful is uh, NVIDIA has been pretty successful in their self-driving car program in generating virtual worlds and basically uh, training their um, system to actually drive through virtual worlds and encounter uh, um, different situations, uh, obstacles, and they, so the question then becomes what's the fidelity of the type of uh, simulation that you're doing? Does it represent the kinds of situations that you expect to encounter? Uh, I believe that in a lot of cases we can represent the scattering, the, sen the sensor physics quite well. We can understand propagation delays. I think where we might have challenges is just in validating those models. And I think that's where uh, basically stepping up from modeling and sim to a virtual live construction would allow us to kind of close that loop. And I think we're always going to be data starved, but we're going to be looking for creative ways of augmenting uh, our data to better learn. And I'll, I'll add to that real quick. One of the other challenges with simulations when you try to simulate the data is that very often using machine learning and AI, the value in that is that it's, it's, it's extracting information that, that a person doesn't. Right? And so if you're depending on a simulator that's developed by a person to, to, to train an artificially intelligent system or intelligent agent, you may be losing those subtle little learning experiences that the machine has that the operator uh, can't account for. Okay, Here, here's what I think is uh, mostly targeted at Ted. Um, given the seeming dependence of mosaic warfare concepts on networks existing and being reliable, uh, how, how do you think we can provide uh, re the reliability of communications that we need, uh, particularly in denied environments, to be able to make Mosaic work? 
Oh, that's a, that's, a, that's a great question, and I think it's one of the grand challenges that we have in the building the composable system. Uh, there are a number of things that we're, uh, that we're working on within the office to try to address that challenge and some things that we need to do to go further than that. And the things that we're working on in the office uh, relate to the... Um, uh, the PFC program that I mentioned. So we want to impose complexity on the adversary's decision-making process. So we can't make it easy for the adversary to interdict those networks. And that means taking advantage of all of the dimensions of complexity, such as spectral agility, as well as interference hiding, as well as uh, moving the signal around aggressively, as well as taking aware, being aware of what our adversary is going to do, knowledge of their algorithms, for example. Uh, but I think uh, what I tried to, to allude to later in the introduction was we want further to take advantage of mission awareness uh, so, so our network is not just delivering bits, but delivering effects. And so if we're aware of the effects we need to deliver, we can modify the network to make it more challenging for our adversary and increase that resilience. But it is certainly uh, it's a tough challenge, I think. And, and I'll just jump on that, if mm -hmm. I may, Ted, and suggest that in this whole theme of lethality as opposed to dominance, uh, we're not necessarily suggesting that every single network and link would be fully robust in one of these denied environments. It's really about the adaptability and the agility, and as Ted said, being able to deliver the mission effect for what we need in that particular case. And I'll just put in a little sales plug for our panel tomorrow, which will talk more about some of these adaptable network concepts. Um, here's another really important one, an extremely challenging one. Uh, so given the focus and a number of the things you mentioned in uh, cross-domain types of solutions and distributed heterogeneous types of things. Who eventually owns these? How do we how do we transition this technology? Who, and how do we how do we pick out the users for them? Yeah, this is one of the challenges we're 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 seeing. We're purposely aimed at the gaps between the traditional acquisition worlds who've been buying complete functional payloads, and we're trying to connect those together. So I think we'll have to build some new structures inside the, the services to, to use these. And the mission-oriented constructs that you alluded to um, in the Mosaic speech yesterday, Tim, I think have to do with that. The mission owners, maybe even the COCOM, start owning capabilities as they relate to the connectiveness and, and the uh, the way that we put everything together to accomplish these types of missions. Now, that, that's not the way our acquisition systems align today, and we acknowledge that. And so we, we're having to build these uh, communities of interest and people who are able to experiment, experiment together. And then when multiple groups see the utility, I think, of these systems and what we're able to get out of them by combining them together, they become believers and they'll buy into this type of collaborative ownership. But uh, I agree that there's something that, that we still need to solve out there and I think each service has a different way that they may, they may approach it. I think some of this is also addressed by um, some of the services are looking at enforcing standards that allow uh, more rapid integration of subsystems. Uh, we talked here about the open systems uh, approach to sector. That allows us to integrate uh, commercially available sensors and communication gear, uh, hopefully on a much faster scale. If, if that kind of policy is adopted uh, more widespread, uh, then it's possible that uh, we could not necessarily have to have the same interface. We have programs uh, such as SoSight uh, that have ways of bridging uh, different interfaces, but it's the exposing of the interfaces and allowing um, uh, things, uh, allowing experimentation and collaboration so we can expose where we need to uh, emphasize. And again, you'll hear more of that tomorrow. I'll add on that too, that, that, that we've seen this problem when we go to try to transition some of these technologies where you run into the requirements problem, right? So if, if I say, hey, I can use this information out of this sensor that some acquisition program owns to support a capability that this other acquisition program owns, Right. Well, suddenly you have a, a huge seams issue, and this acquisition program doesn't have a requirement to give that information, and so without a requirement, uh, you, you don't get that transition path. And so truly, these become disruptive ways um, to acquisition on, on how you do uh, this type of mosaic warfare. 
just to amplify a little bit of what uh, John Gorman was saying, I think one of the opportunities we have is that we're, we're talking about systems that by themselves have some capability, and, and to Dave's point, they could satisfy some requirement. It's really hard if we say they have to only have an architecture. You can't do anything unless you have the whole architecture. I don't think we'll ever get, get where we want to go if that's the approach. But if we have things that by themselves do something, mm -hmm. can satisfy some requirement, but we still have a way to piece them together, then I think we'll eventually get to these mosaic kinds of things. Uh, I think we have time for at least one more question here. So given um, that we're talking a lot of, of lower end distributed types of things, and even including relying on, on uh, potentially commercial uh, or less controlled types of environments, how do we get to the point where we can trust the data, both from an actual quality of data, uh, the integrity of the data, and the quality of service of that data? <laughs> it was both. I mean, both sure. Us. Yeah, it's a challenge. The the distributed the distributed trust. Uh, you know, you need to understand that the network is giving you the information in which you have confidence. So uh, there are a variety of techniques that people are exploring for how you do that. There's the traditional method of of information validation and security, uh, but there are also uh, distributed ways of doing that, such as a reputation based uh, uh, security where I can observe the elements of my composable system, and if it's not behaving in a manner consistent with how it behaves, my trust metric goes down and I change my behavior. This is something that's been applied in network defense techniques, for example. Let's I would also, also offer that we may have to go back to a, a fundamental model and understanding of, of just nature. Uh, if you're trying to understand whether your GPS sensors have been spoofed or not, uh, you may have to basically compare that to uh, some other sensor that you have and, and, and put some determination in there. Same thing goes with uh, seeing is believing, right? If, 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 you're, if your sensor is showing you something that is not maybe physically possible, then maybe you have to have a way of deciding whether you can trust that. So I guess building in mm -hmm. some sort of a trust system into your comms mm -hmm. and into the sensors that are going into the decision maker yeah. The and it's going to be all his fault if we somehow make the wrong decision with bad data, right? Yeah, the heterogeneity and the numbers start to solve that problem for you, right? So it's, it's the voting either cross domain or it's yeah. the nearest neighbor problem saying, hey, this, this one reading here doesn't make sense. And figuring out how to mix heterogeneity and increase numbers into our evaluation of trust is important. It's not just synthesis, not just bringing in lots of data. Now it's looking at that data and cross-validating it. Sort of like like uh, the I2O guys in the plenary today were talking about collusion as a way of of building trust. It, yes. it, it was fascinating that all of those uh, all of those presentations uh, hit on the nature of trust as an important dimension. So. A lot more questions and things we could discuss, but we're just about out of time. I'm, I'm going to uh, uh, just answer one last question here by way of, an, of uh, again, an additional sales plug. It's a question about simulating the environment relevant to a lot of the sensors and effects kinds of things we're talking about, and uh, that'll specifically be a topic for our panel session tomorrow. I'll also put in a sales plug for right after this. A number of us are gonna be running over across the atrium to time as a weapon which will continue to develop some of the mosaic warfare theme. So with that, I'd like to uh, thank our panel. Thanks, thank